Um, so we often have invasive species talks at this, and we wanted to kind of be specific a little bit this time and focus in on invasive shrubs, particularly because they're often one of our biggest issues uh, in our forest and in management of our forest. So go ahead there. Oh. So what I'm going to do is kind of start really briefly just impacts and why we're concerned about invasive shrubs. Uh, get into a handful of the common invasive shrub species that we'll, we would deal with here in forest. And then finally end up with management techniques and recommendations for these different. So invasive species in general are serious threats to our, the management of our forest, our natural resources. When they, when they invade our, our forest, they lead to a loss of diversity, a loss of productivity, a reduction in the quality of wildlife habitat. Um, one good example is bush honeysuckle. It's one that probably most of us are very familiar with. There's some neat research out there showing that uh, invasion of bush honeysuckle, which is an understory shrub, they're such a good competitor for water and nutrients that they can lead to the decline of your already established canopy overstory trees by up to 50%. So your trees are growing half as quick as they would otherwise with honeysuckle in there. And then you add to that, it's such a, such a heavy shade caster that it basically eliminates native trees, native seedling establishment um, in the understory. So then it's another impact on your forest. And then not only to our trees, we're finding more and more that there's a lot of impacts to uh, wildlife uh, from these shrubs. Uh, one could be a really increased nest predation on ground or shrub nesting birds um, because they nest in these shrubs and they're more vulnerable to predation by rat snakes or raccoons. Some weird things like altered water chemistry, so it changes your uh, invertebrates in your streams and your fish communities in your streams just from their change in the water chemistry from their leaves. And then changing the climate condition, microclimate conditions that, that really deter reptile use and other things. So there's really far reaching kind of impacts from these. And then a big health one um, we're learning more now is this issue of tick-borne diseases and how they're really strongly related to the presence of invasive shrubs. And the more they look at this, the, the more they realize this is a really tight relationship. So they're finding with these invasive shrubs that their perfect habitat for um, these tick species, it gets them in close proximity to the small mammals that they need to pick up these diseases. And so there's orders of magnitude more infected ticks per acre in invaded forests. I think one study found 130 to 300 infected ticks per acre in an, uh, in an in invaded forest. In our natural forest, it was something like 3 to 30. So really the chances of human health issues because of these invasive shrubs we're finding is very severe. Now there's a bunch of different shrubs that we deal with, invaders, but these are some of the ones that I think are the common ones that we deal with um, in this region. Bush honeysuckle at the top, right, that's one of our biggest issues. Autumn olive is, a, is a less shade tolerant, but it still gets in our forest, it still is an issue. Uh, buckthorn, particularly if you go a little east of here, is a big, big problem. And then three kind of newer ones that you may be less familiar with as invaders. Barberry, burning bush, and collery pear. And we'll get into all of these. So what I think is probably the number one invasive problem in our forest, not just invasive shrub, but just invasive plant problem nowadays, I think is bush honeysuckle. And for those reasons we talked about a minute ago, because of just the sheer level of impact it can do, because it can invade fairly high quality forest, it doesn't need that disturbance to get in there. There's a lot of reasons why I think this is kind of our number one threat in terms of invasive plants in our forest. If you're unfamiliar with it, you know, it is a true shrub. It's multi-stem shrub. It's uh, pretty easy to identify with those opposite leaves. Kind of, some are pointed, some are rounded, but they're all opposite simple leaves. They typically have whitish to pinkish flowers that are somewhat fragrant, but not super fragrant. And then the fruit um, can be bright red, and then some of the, the different species of bush honeysuckle can have orangish fruit. But they're always on there. So there's some berries, but really in the spring when it flowers, you know, it's almost unmistakable with those kind of honeysuckle-like flowers. And then this forms those big stands, right? Big, heavy, dense uh, infestations of this kind of carpeting the understory in your forest. But if, you, if you're unsure about it, if it may or may not be honeysuckle, again, you're looking for those opposite leaves. Um, some of the honeysuckles will have a little bit more rounded leaf, but you, know, you want those opposite leaves and then that kind of light tan stringy bark are good characteristics. When it flowers, it'll have you know, those kind of classic honeysuckle flowers and then the bright berries. Even in the winter, it's pretty easy to identify. It'll have these arching kind of stems. You can still see the opposite stems on it. And then if you're unsure, then you can cut it open and the pith is hollow in honeysuckle. So it's pretty easy to pick out. 
Um, just some notes, it does have bird dispersed seeds, as most of these do. And like I said earlier, it doesn't require a lot of disturbance to establish it invades these high quality woodlands, and that's why we're worried about it. Uh, really big impacts in terms of our effects, like we, just, we mentioned already. So it's, again, one of our biggest ones. Um, the second one is autumn olive. People are pretty familiar with autumn olive. Yeah, I think I would think. It's, um, to me, I see it in the forest a lot, but I think it's most of an impactful, like in young forest or tree plantings. I've seen a lot of tree plantings fail because they didn't prep beforehand, get rid of the autumn olive, and it basically outgrew the tree seedlings and shaded them out. So unfortunately, a lot of instances where people lost 80 to 90 percent of their trees just from autumn olive infestations. But it's, you know, it's another large shrub. It tends to get a little bigger than bush honeysuckle. It tends to be more, um, it can be multi-stemmed, but it typically has a little bit more of a central stem than honeysuckle does. Um, it's alternate, so it's not opposite, it's alternate. It's pretty easy to identify because of the silvery underside of the leaves. You flip a leaf over, it'll have all these silvery dots on it. Uh, even the berries will have some kind of little dots on them as well, so it's pretty easy to identify. The, the creamy yellow whitish flowers in the spring are very, very fragrant, so it really smells uh, a lot like that. And then it has this dark tan bark. And then, like I said, even in a forested situation, we have seen some in the shade. Uh, typically, it's less shade tolerant than the others, but you still can find places where there's plenty of it. Um, this is more kind of common where you'll see it in these open edges. It was used a lot for um, wildlife plantings back in the day. It's a nitrogen fixer, so it can handle pretty poor soil, which is one of the reasons we used it so much. Um, but you can see the berries there, uh, the, the creamy white flowers, and then particularly that picture up top with that silvery underside of the leaf. That's really the best way to identify it. It does have some spines. It can, some do and some don't. Um, but a lot of them are spined and then the twigs will have all these little dots on them. So even in the winter, it's pretty easy. To... This one is bird dispersed, just like bush honeysuckle. It's uh, pretty, really abundant. It reinfests sites easily. And then again, it can handle that really poor soil. So it can, it can grow just about anywhere. Um, the one that's um, I get more common in Illinois anyway on the east side of the state, it's still found plenty throughout Iowa and Wisconsin as well as common buckthorn. Do people deal with common buckthorn much? Oh yeah, okay. A lot of people raise their hands. I have to stop calling, I'm going to stop calling it less common then. Um, this one's an interesting one to identify in the sense that it's opposite but it's also considered sub-opposite. So if you see the, 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 the leaves or the, or the twigs, Oftentimes, they're not straight across from each other. They're close, but they're off just a little bit, and that's an unusual characteristic. They call it buckthorn because the, the ends of the branches have a little spine that comes out. So instead of having a terminal bud, a bud at the end, it'll have one little spine poking out, and that's what they call it, the buckthorn. But it's, uh, it's pretty easy to identify. The leaves kind of have that arcing look to their veins, kind of like a dogwood but um, they'll have the darker bark. If you're unsure, you can peel the middle of the bark and it'll have a bright orange under bark that's really unique. So on the left is a picture of a big infestation. On the right, you can see that the, the twigs, or the leaves are across from each other, but they're not quite. They're almost opposite, but not quite opposite sometimes. And then if you see the next picture here, um, you can see that little spine at the end of the branch. That's the little thorn, I think why they call it buckthorn. It has dark purple berries um, on it. Those berries will persist well into winter. So a lot of times you can even pick it out just by the berries in the winter. And then darker bark, and you can see on the left-hand picture that, that bright orange under bark. If I'm ever unsure, and I think it might be buckthorn, I just take a knife and peel a little bit of that bark, and you can really see it after. There is another buckthorn called glossy buckthorn, which is a, an invasive species as well. It typically grows more in wetland, wet forest, or wet habitats. It looks pretty similar, but the veins don't arc and curve like it does. So their veins are more straight, but it also has those dark purple berries. So those are the really common ones that we're all pretty familiar with. Some of the other ones that are coming on now and becoming more of a problem, probably the biggest one I'm seeing just across the whole Midwest now is collery pear, uh, flowering pear is another name for it, um, Bradford pear, Cleveland pear. Are people seeing it escape a bit too? You're seeing it a lot? So this time of year, if you wait three or four, uh, up here, three or four, maybe five weeks, um, you start driving along the interstates, you start driving along roads, you're going to start seeing a lot of white flowering trees along the road. Chances are those are going to be collery pear. They've been found now escaped in every county in Illinois. I know they're bad in parts of Iowa as well. So they, it's really becoming, quickly becoming our, our new invader that's really spreading really rapidly. It is, uh, so it's pretty easy to identify. It's one that, um, again, it flowers before it leaves out. So early spring, it'll have these white, five white petal flowers. 
Um, it has bird dispersed seeds as well, and again, it moves around. It's still an ornamental. It's planted, it's planted a lot even today. Um, and the question is, you know, wasn't this plant sterile? I thought it, a lot of people were told this plant wouldn't spread and wouldn't move around. And actually, it didn't move around for years and years. Um, the, the issue with brad or collary pear is that it's um, self-infertile, so it needs a different individual to pollinate. So a flower on one plant cannot pollinate another flower on that same plant. They have to cross-pollinate. Um, the problem with the varieties is they're all asexually reproduced, right? So they, um, they're all from stem cutting. So genetically, the cultivar is all genetically the same individual. So a Bradford cultivar cannot pollinate a Bradford cultivar. So it's when they started coming out with new different cultivars and planting these new varieties out on the landscape was suddenly when they, we started seeing uh, fertile fruit being produced. That's why after 20 or 30 years, we suddenly started seeing this plant start to escape. And then now we see sites like this pretty common um, in early spring and more and more. And these are just a couple shots. There's a lot of things out there that you can see, a lot of sites like this. Um, it has alternate leaves, simple leaves. They're that classic um, kind of heart-shaped. They look a little different than the, the ornamental variety. The, the ornamental varieties have bigger, shiny leaves. The escaped ones have smaller leaves that aren't as shiny. Also, the escapes tend to be shorter, multi-stemmed, and they have thorns. So they kind of revert back to the old wild type. They don't look a lot like the ornamental. A lot of people mistake them for plums uh, or other plants because they're just not, com they're not familiar with what it looks like in its wild type form. It does have fall color. You can even see the fall color in the escape. But the picture on the top is kind of the ornamental variety uh, leaf. And the picture on the bottom is what the escape variety looks like. They look quite a bit different. Again, it reverts back. Uh, on the top right, you can see those little thorns. So it becomes quite a thorny shrub. And this is the number one problem in the land that I own. We have more collar repair problems than multiflora rose and autumn olive combined. We have a lot of issues with this. And tree planting is a big issue. Yep. Another one that we're really seeing to move around quite a bit, and I've seen a lot more of it in the forest now, is burning bush. Burning bush is a common ornamental. We see it planted in everybody's front yard. I call it the dentist office tree, or dentist office bush, because every dentist office I've ever been to has it right in front of it. And if you're a dentist, I apologize for that statement. <laughs> but it's, you know, it goes by a couple different names, but burning bush is the common one, or winged burning bush. That bright red fall color, right, that's what you really jumps out to you. Um, it really is a kind of a unique plant. The picture on the, the next picture here coming, these are all seedlings underneath this. So it really does a heavy seed producer. Um, I first found this plant from a tree stand, right? So I was sitting up in a tree stand hunting and I looked out uh, out in the distance and I saw this patch of red and it bothered me the whole time I was in that tree because I didn't know what it was. It's like, what is that red? Why is there red in the forest? And finally I got aggravated enough that I climbed down, walked over and it was a big stand of this just a carpet of thousands of seedlings in the understory. So this one's pretty easy to identify. You have to be a little careful because we do have a native Euonymus. We have a, the, our native Wahoo is, looks similar. The big difference is they're both opposite. They both have toothed leaves. This winged burning bush has a, a petiole, a stem of the leaf that's almost non-existent. It's a really short stem, almost no stem. The leaf kind of is attached directly to the, 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 the twig like that and then it's kind of widest out towards the end. So that looks a little different than our native one, which does have a, a petiole to the leaf and it's widest kind of in the middle of the leaf. So it looks a little bit different like that. It also, some mostly, but not always, will have wingings or corkiness on the bark, uh, especially on the, twi on the twigs, but not always. It usually has green twigs as well. So you can see kind of an extreme example here on the left, especially the left top and the bottom. You can really see those corky wingings but the one on the bottom right has no wingings. So it's very variable like that. And then you can see the leaves have almost no stem, right? Almost no petiole to those leaves. It's very short. Uh, the fruit will start and it'll kind of peel open like that and have these little red fruit. Um, again, abundant fruit. Birds seem to move it around quite a bit. And I think the last one of the, the shrubs that I'm gonna just mention before I get into management is Japanese barberry. Japanese barberry is one that I was really surprised once um, we started looking for it and how much we found it. It seems to be similar to honeysuckle in the sense that we're finding it invading even high quality, mature forests that are undisturbed. So it doesn't seem to need that kind of disturbance to really jump in there and invade. We're finding in actually some of our nature preserves, some of our really high quality forests, and that's why we're worried about it. Um, it's widely planted as an ornamental, so you see it moved around quite a bit. 
still planted a lot, a um, lot of different varieties, a lot of different shapes, a lot of different colors, leaf colors for the ornamentals. What tends to happen is uh, when it reverts or escapes, it kind of all goes back to that same wild type. So even if you plant a red, a red leaf variety that's tall uh, or even short, uh, when it escapes, it'll kind of go back to that same normal green bushy look. So they do tend to revert a little bit. But uh, spiny plant, so it impacts walking around. Um, and there's some examples of some really big infestations of this. This is the one that's probably close, most closely tied to tick-borne diseases. At least in terms of the research, there seems to be a pretty close tie to barberry infestations and, and Lyme disease. So it's pretty easy to identify. It's a, really a multi-stem shrub. It's quite smaller than the rest of them. It'll have single spines on it, and the leaves are, um, they look like a little spoon. So they're really narrow at the, at the bottom, and they get to the end of it. It's a really wide leaf, really small in general leaves, but again, that looks like a spoon, which is pretty easy to pick it out. Um, the fruit are kind of an oblong. They're not a round fruit, but they're a long fruit. So you can see here that kind of weird looking uh, leaf what's really widest at the end, almost like a spoon, a lot of different color, coloration to the leaves. And then the kind of the, the weird shape to the fruit, um, the, the flowers hang down on it and they'll flower in the spring, but then that fruit lasts into winter and you can really easily see that. So those are some of the, what I think are the big shrubs that you as landowners would actually start, would be more likely to see and more likely to need to manage. When we talk about management, there's some, uh, there's some considerations to think about. The main thing is that most of these invasive shrubs do have bird dispersed seeds. So they're going to move around quite a bit whether um, you clean your equipment or not, right? So birds are going to move them from adjacent sites. So even if you control it on your land, you've got to expect that these, these plants will move in quite a bit. Um, but the good thing about them is most of these have very little seed bank ability. So their seeds typically don't live very long in the soil. Right, one to two years um, is kind of max for most of these. Some of our invasive problems we have will live a decade. Some will live 50 years in the soil, those seeds, so they'll have a hard time. The nice thing about these shrubs is that if you can halt that seed production, that seed bank goes away pretty quickly. And then they, uh, the other issue is when you're managing them, you've got to realize that all of these will sprout aggressively if you just cut them without treating them. So often just straight cutting these plants it's not going to do enough that they're going to just come back and sprout aggressively. So um, there we go. So just a couple shots of honeysuckle where we cut the honeysuckle and walked away. And you know, the early that next spring, it's just coming right back, right? So that's something, again, it's, it, makes, it makes mechanical management or just cutting it without chemicals sometimes a little difficult unless you take another step. So when I consider these, uh, if you have a lot of, of invasive species on your land and too much to really control it all at one time, you're going to have to prioritize some things. And so for me, I always like to prioritize if I have any significant resource at risk. Say you already you invested a lot of money in a new tree planting. You want to keep that tree planting from failing by controlling that autumn olive. That would be a priority for you because you made an investment in it. If you have an area that may be... Um, you know, have some rare plants or something that you really like in there or an endangered species or something that you really value for your land. Those are kind of some of your priority sites. If you don't have that or you want to know where to start, I often start at new infestations, uh, species that are spreading aggressively. So if you found that first barberry on your land and it's really starting to spread, that would be a priority over that 20 acres of multiflora rose that's been there since you're a kid. So again, looking for those new infestations, those spreading ones, those are kind of the places to start. And you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, I'm going to go into the worst of the worst right in the middle and attack it and really attack that. I tend to think of it the other way better, where I kind of work on the edges, limit th those infestations, and then slowly work my way back in. I think you'll get a little more benefit that way, and you'll contain it, instead of spending a lot of your money on the worst part at first. But that's just kind of the way I like to prioritize deciding what to control if I can't control everything. So when I'm managing plants, um, your goal is really not just to kill them and get rid of them. Our ultimate goal is to take the steps necessary to reduce, or prevent, or eliminate those negative impacts. The reason we're controlling these invasive shrubs is because of those negative impacts. They do something that hampers what our management, that impacts our forest. Some kind of negative uh, result of having those plants is why we manage them. So our management it needs to be aimed at reducing that negative impact. That could be eradicating them, completely eliminating from your land. Sometimes it doesn't have to go that far. If that's going to be too costly, you can consider steps to 
limit their impact. So sometimes it's the use of prescribed fire. We find that prescribed fire in a lightly invaded forest does a really good job of keeping some of these species in check, keeping them from really spreading much, but we won't get rid of them. But it's a cheap alternative and it's a good way to limit those negative impacts. Uh, one resource I wanted to share with you guys that's relatively new uh, is the Midwest Invasive Plant Networks. They have a, a plant control database. So it's online and it has a ton of different species involved in this. And if it's something that you're just learning and wanting to kind of figure out what are your options for control, this is a great site to go to. You can go in and type the species name in there and it'll give you mechanical control, non-chemical control, and then different kind of chemical control options or combinations. And they're all rated in terms of what is most effective, what is uh, really reserved for an expert versus novices. Um, so it's a good place, again, to kind of get that full list of what's available to you as a landowner in terms of option to control these. So that's something that definitely bookmark it and visit it quite a bit. Now, for any infestation that you do control and you're able to get in there and control that, inf that full infestation, I always say that don't do anything once, right? If you go in one time and control it and spend money and then walk away, you're just going to kind of tick these off. They're going to just come back with a vengeance. I always say expect three to five years of work before you can really get something under control. There's always going to be plants you miss. There's always going to be plants that, uh, for whatever reason, you did treat and they didn't die. So 85% of the cost is going to be that first year, but you're still going to need those second, third, fourth years to really clean up and make sure that you, you're, you're getting the benefits from that big investment the first year. So anytime you do management, make sure that you can, you can dedicate that much time to controlling these populations. Uh, and then just add to that, clean your equipment. If you come in and mow this or something, you don't want to be spreading this invasive species around as you're trying to control it. So I always recommend keeping boots clean for dragging other invasives around, keeping mower decks clean, spraying off your equipment. It's just a good practice to stay with so you're not moving these things around. And then kind of anticipate problems. So if this is your land, and say, um, whoa, uh drop my, that was kind of weird, wasn't it? It's going to be a weird recording. All right, so if this is your land, and you've spent all your time controlling it on the right, but your property line uh, is there, what's going to happen, right? So go ahead. So that's, you control it, you make all this effort, and then uh, that's your property line. Your neighbor's not doing anything over there. You can expect that this is going to happen year to year. You're going to have to come back in there and control this. It's not going to just walk away. You've got a ready available seed source, and a reinvasion is just going to happen, right? So this is something to expect when you're planning. You put a lot of effort in controlling it. You know you're going to have to come back year to year. This is going to be an annual thing, unless you can get your neighbor to step up and control on their land as well. So some of the, the methods we have, there are some mechanical control methods that you can use. For smaller in, uh, individuals, you can hand pull them if you have good moist soil. Uh, you'll find out that some are easier to do that than others. Bush honeysuckle is a fairly shallow root system. Even a decent sized plant the size of your thumb or something like that pulls out of the ground really, relatively easily. You can do what you want and you can't get an autumn to come out of the ground. They have really well developed root systems. So it depends. Um, so this. What in the picture here is a weed wrench, and there's a bunch of different kind of these out available. And they are just, uh, they're a lever for pulling stuff out. I always say they're the best thing to have somebody else to use. <laughs> right? Because um, they are a bear. You get really tired after two of these. So what I like to do, we have work days, and we get people coming in, and I pick out the, try to get the two biggest guys that are teenagers, if they're at the work day, and I challenge them on which one can do the most, and I really let that test testosterone and their egos get a lot of work for me because they will work each other to death trying to beat the other person. That's the way I get a lot of work with these. My goal is to not use one if I can help it, right? So, but but they're they're handy to have. Again, if you're if you don't want to use uh, chemicals, you can get a lot of work done with one of these. So it's definitely something that you can try. Overall, we do use chemical control. So again, these things sprout aggressively. So we often. Um, we have to use some level of herbicide to control them. There are some other options for non-chemical control. There's a thing called a, a buckthorn baggie now, which is basically just a, a heavy black plastic bag. You cut the buckthorn down, you leave it about six inches tall, you put this little bag over it, and then zip tie it on there, and you leave it on for a year. 
I've heard some mixed results, right? I've heard sometimes that that sprouts out from around it or things like that, but some people are having some luck for, with that for a non-chemical control method. But chemicals, the one thing I definitely got to add is that if you do want to use herbicides, you have to follow that label. It is the law. It'll have your rates, the locations, what species you can use on it. You have to follow that, and you definitely have to be safe. So following that and wearing your uh, the correct PPE, your right protective equipment. That includes eye protection, long sleeve pants, uh, long sleeve sh uh, shirts, uh, closed toed shoes, which sounds funny, but you definitely need that stuff. And then some of those chemical gloves. I've seen so many people come out in like flip flops and Bermuda shorts, right? Spraying stuff. Yeah, don't do that, right? It's be safe. A um, couple other things is don't spray over your head in general. So I, t I tend to not foliar spray stuff unless it's six feet or less. Because if I'm spraying up here, I can't control what I'm doing. The other thing I do is I tend to spray where I've already walked and not where I'm walking, right? So don't walk and spray because you're just walking right through it. Some little things like that to kind of avoid exposure into some of these herbicides will make it a lot safer for you to use. Um, there's a couple herbicides that we use. Um, there's a lot of different herbicides available, and there's a lot of different herbicides that, that are very effective on shrubs. I kind of limit this talk to two different herbicides. They're kind of the most common two that we use for invasive shrubs. They're both pretty safe. They're both um, easily found, uh, and then they both have formulations that any landowner can buy. So the, big, the first one, as everybody knows, is glyphosate, right? So glyphosate is Roundup. Uh, rodeo, there's a lot of generics out there. It's a broad spectrum herbicide that will control any plant that you, you spray on it. it um, there are some aquatic labeled versions, so that's nice if you're working in uh, wet areas or areas where you may get, get exposure to water. And it works both as a foliar application, and we'll talk about that in a second, but spraying the leaves, and it works well as a cut stump. So you're cutting that stump and then treating that surface. So it can kind of be used as both of them. Um, what it does not work for is a basil bark. And we'll talk about what basil bark is later, but this is not one to use for that. The other herbicide we use a lot is triclopyr. So triclopyr is garlon, uh, Tahoe, there's a bunch of gene uh, generics. You probably know it a lot as it's mixed with 2,4-D and called crossbow or crossroads. So those are the other really common one. Now it is different than glyphosate because it is a broadleaf only. So it doesn't really work on grasses at all. So if you have cases where these invasive shrubs are working in areas or invading areas that have um, desirable grass species or sedge species, you can use this uh, herbicide and it won't impact those grasses. Now there are two formulations, and this is kind of where it gets confusing. There's an amine and an ester formulation, and they both work a little different. The amine you typically mix with water, and it doesn't volatize very much, so it has some uses that way. We use it for cut stumps. It's really good for that. And we use it for foliar sprays, but not for basil bark. It also has an aquatic label. The ester formulation, you mix with oil. And so it works really well as a basil bark. We use it as a cut stump. But it has some volatilization problems if you would use it in warm weather. So you kind of have to decide what you're using and which one you want to view. Now, kind of the, the standard method or one of our favorite methods for controlling um, all of these invasive shrubs are cut stumps. That basically means you just cut it down, you treat the stump with herbicide to prevent it from re-sprouting. A couple things to make it uh, a little more effective is you want to get that stump a little low. You don't want to have a really high stump, one that's a tripping hazard, you're going to fall over it, you may do some damage to yourself. Um, but two, it's, that's just that much more distance for that herbicide to travel. Your goal is not to kill the top part of that plant, that's easy. Your goal is to kill the roots of the plant, that's where it becomes more difficult. You want that herbicide to be translocated down into that root and kill the roots of that plant so it won't sprout. So keeping your stumps low, that being said, you don't want them so low that you're getting into the dirt. So I usually cut them an inch or two high. If you cut them in, if you leave them down into the dirt, a lot of times that dirt will get on top of that stump and it'll actually limit the amount of herbicide that goes into it. So there's me proving just that I do get outside every once in a while. I love those, uh, saw, those little uh, brush saws like that, it does a good job. But you cut it down. You treat the stump, I like these little um, 409 kind of bottles, chemical bottles like that. They work well for kind of limiting and really figuring out exactly how much herbicide and you prevent a lot of overspray. Um, I use herbicide dye a lot because it helps me figure out what I've treated and what I haven't. You can buy the dye at any farm store, add a few drops into your bottle, it'll really help you prevent uh, misses and, and oversprays. 
Now, the, in general, and these are again, depending on the formulations you buy, but in general, you use concentrated, more concentrated formulations to do a cut stop. You're using a little bit of herbicide, and so you want it to be more concentrated. Typically, it's 25 to 50% mixture of glyphosate with water. Works pretty well. And then with uh, triclopyr, it's a little bit less, 17 or 20% or up to 25% works pretty well. Again, you have to look at what formulation you buy and read that label for the specific recommendations. Um, this one, you want to treat immediately after controlling it. There's been a lot of neat research out there showing that those plants start to compartmentalize that damage right as you cut it. When it does that, those cells that have been cut right at the surface really re they, they stop translocating, stop moving that herbicide. So if you wait more than 10 minutes or so, that plant's going to have a really reduced ability to take that herbicide up. So much so that if you control it right away and do it and spray it right away, you may get 90, 95 percent of the plants that you treat. If you wait an hour or so and do it, you may only kill, end up killing 60 percent of those plants. So that's a big difference. That's a lot of time wasted. So go ahead and cut and treat right away. This whole idea of cutting it and then coming back after lunch and treating them all, it's not as effective. You definitely need to curl right away. Overall, if the plant's small, it's a one inch diameter or less, I would say go ahead and treat the whole surface of the, of the plant. If it's bigger, you only really have to treat that outside edge. I tend to be a little liberal on the, the amount of herbicide I put on there because I want, it to, I want to kill that plant. So I put enough on there that it kind of runs, starts to run off just a little bit off the edge. And that just ensures that I put enough herbicide on there. I've seen some people just barely dab it so that it's colored. It gets a little bit of that dye on there. And to me, I've had a lot of bad luck by a little bit too careful of an of a application where I don't put enough herbicide on there. So go ahead and make sure you get enough on there to, for it to take up. Uh, this is most effective mid to late fall. It's really the best time to do it. But you can do this uh, cut stump treatments really any time throughout the, the year with the exception of when those plants are actively starting to grow in the spring. So as soon as that bud starts swelling, that sap starts, starts running in the spring, that's when you don't want to control it. From that point until the leaves are fully leafed out, that's the period that you want to kind of stay away from. Now basil bark is similar, but you don't cut it down. You just apply the herbicide right onto the stem and you use an ester-based herbicide because it penetrates through the bark and it kills, and it kills it that way. It has the advantage that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to go out there and cut it, right? So you don't have all that slash to deal with. You don't have to deal with chainsaws or loppers. You can just spray it. It uses a little bit more herbicide, but it seems to be really effective. Uh, what it will do, if you do this in the fall or winter, those plants will often leaf out in the spring, and you think, oh shoot, I have, I failed, right? They'll leaf out in the spring, and then they'll die after that. So don't be too scared when you see the plants leafing out. It seems to be highly effective on some plants, not so much on others. We use it a lot for autumn olive, use it for brad for collery pear. Uh, it doesn't seem to work very well for honeysuckle. So we tend to not do basil bark for honeysuckle, but for some of these thinner, tighter bark species, it seems to work pretty well. And you, one thing you need to do is make sure that you treat the whole stem from about ground level up to 12 to 14 inches. It seems to work. With, if you have multiple stems, you want to treat each stem. I really like using these backpack sprayers with a long wand. It lets me reach in there to make sure I get everything. Um, smaller woody stems, it works well. It does use a little bit more herbicide. You have that, that slash is standing, so you don't have to deal with it right then. Uh, again, using a dye works really well, and this is fall and winter is the best time to do it. Uh, the last kind, of last kind of treatment I'm talking about is foliar treatments, and that's um, basically spraying the leaves, killing it that way. Um, big thing to, to highlight this, about this treatment is you need a healthy, actively growing plant to kill it, which sounds kind of weird. The more the plant is stressed, the more the plant is compromised by drought, by frost, um, anything else, the less that plant is photosynthesizing and the less it's going to take up that herbicide. So you need a plant that's healthy, green, actively growing before you can use a foliar herbicide to kill it. Otherwise, it's not going to do a very good job. Now, I always like adding this picture in here. This is a bush honeysuckle, and it's in the fall, and you can see that it's already starting to yellow a little bit. This is past it. I would not spray, fo I would not spray the foliage of this plant is you would not kill this plant. It's already stopped photosynthesizing. It's already shutting down for the fall. And those, you can spray those leaves all you want, and it's not going to kill this plant. Again, you want that really um, healthy looking leaves to be able to control it. Um, you want to spray all the leaves thoroughly with herbicide, kind of almost to the point of runoff, but not so much that it's dripping off. So then, and then you're wasting herbicide. And then you want to try to get a good coverage across the whole plant. 
Again, backpack sprayers work really well. Again, I only tend to spray stuff six foot high or less just because of safety. I don't want to spray over side over my head. Um, these use a lot more spray in general, so you typically use a dilute formulation. Again, read the label to make sure what your formulation is using. We were typically, we're talking about 1 to 4 percent. So very small amounts of herbicide diluted, um, and then you spray it. That's kind of an advantage. It's a little bit more safer that way. But again, you're spraying, so there's a little bit more chance for overspray versus just treating that cut stump. Now there's some stuff. Um, there's been a lot of work in the last couple years on aerial control. And so the one thing about honeysuckle in particular is it stays green two and a half to three or three and a half weeks longer than a lot of our native shrubs. It'll often be green and healthy and growing after our trees have lost their leaves. So that gives us a window in the fall for heavy infestations that um, there's not a lot of else growing. It's just these dense infestations of honeysuckle. It gives the opportunity to treat them with an aerial application of glyphosate. We've done that some in Illinois and had really good luck where we've got 80% or more control for um, something like 30 to $40 an acre. And so we use it as a first entry to come in on really heavy stands where the landowners otherwise really couldn't afford to do that because if you come in and pay somebody to cut, stump, treat it, and do something else on the ground, it's $500 an acre or more sometimes because it's just really dense. This will do that first impact, knock it back, and then we'll follow it up with spot treatments or prescribed fire. It's been highly effective for us. The one issue is if you have plants, native plants that are green at that same time, they may get impacted a little bit. Red cedars will get impacted, a river cane will get impacted, uh, deciduous holly, Carolina buckthorn, which is a native buckthorn, uh, Christmas ferns, some sedges. So there's a few things in there that you have to be careful about. But um, if you have a heavy stand, typically you've got just honeysuckle. Again, it seems to be very effective for us. And we've actually, a couple sites that we've done this aerial control and then found a whole suite of native plants that were suppressed by this honeysuckle that just in one year came out. We found hill prairies, a lot of neat native plants. So we've had a really good luck in heavy infestations using aerial control. And then this is kind of the results afterwards, a year after, see all the dead standing honeysuckle there. So if you have those situations, you kind of need enough acres to, to reduce that price because most of the price is getting the air applicator down there. So your per acre price really goes down if you get a lot of acres. Um, you will get a little bit of miss, so that's why I said 80% control. A lot of times you'll go out there and you'll see this, where these plants may end up dying actually uh, sometime during that year, uh, or they may kind of hold on a little bit. But overall, it does a good job of, of killing them. Now the other thing we do with heavy infestations that may be an option for landowners is forestry mulching. So you use a skid steer or some other piece of equipment with one of those rotating heads on it, and you basically grind everything down to the ground and set it back to zero. Um, again, this is for heavy infestations where you don't know what else to do. This seems to work pretty well. Um, again, to kind of set everything back to zero, what it happens, you'll kill about 30 or 40 percent of those plants right away without doing anything else. It'll just shatter the root collars and they won't come back. The rest will sprout back, and you can either um, try to treat them right then and try to find those stumps. I've not had good luck with that. Usually I wait the following growing season, let those sprouts get two to three feet tall, and then spray them at that point, and it seems to be pretty effective. But again, if you don't, you don't have enough ground or aerial control doesn't work for you and you have a bad infestation, this may be an option for you. It looks kind of bad right at first, uh, but it sure beats a big stand of honeysuckle. So uh, again, you, wanna, you can either follow up immediately with a cut stump treatment. I don't like that. I have not had good luck with that. Again, I wait until those plants are two to three feet tall and spray them at that point. I've had a lot better luck. Um, just a few general recommendations that are specific to the species. For bush honeysuckle, I really like uh, glyphosate. I have not had good luck with triclopyr. I've had mixed results where it works sometimes, it doesn't work other times. So much so that I basically only recommend glyphosate now for honeysuckle. It seems to be much more effective. Uh, cut stump with about 50%. We've actually went down all the way to 15% and still had good control. Um, again, basal bark is inconsistent. I don't typically do that. Prescribed fire does a good job of knocking it back and keeping it low, but it won't get rid of it. We have not been able to get rid of it with prescribed fire. For autumn olive, basal bark works really well. We do a lot of basal bark for it. It seems to be uh, an effective treatment. Cut stump works pretty well as, as, as well. 
And then collar repair, we haven't done a lot of work with collar repair yet. We're finding that we can kill it with foliar applications or cut stump with either triclopyr or glyphosate. It seems to work pretty well. Uh, basil bark is something we're starting on collar repair and it seems to be uh, promising with it too. For the others, uh, burning bush, it seems to be actually pretty easy to kill, which is nice. Cut stump, basil bark, foliar, any of those seem to work pretty well for it. Um, it's, it's not a difficult one to control. Barberry, there's been some look, work um, looking at using propane torches and just torching the root collar at the ground and holding that propane torch on it for 15 seconds or so. And it seems to be an effective way to kill it without using chemicals if you want to. Again, just basically torching the base of each plant. That seems to be an effective method. And so with that, I just wanted to kind of go over these briefly and I'll take questions for the rest of the time. The, so the question is, does stump treating with chemicals, does it pose a hazard to the mature trees? It can. So one of the things you have to worry about is over applying herbicides in a given area. So all herbicides have kind of a, a maximum label rate for application in a year. And so if you over apply, if you have a dog hair stand of honeysuckle or one of these invasives and you put a lot of herbicide down, there's potential to do damage to uh, neighboring plants, to overstory plants. The reason I, I've selected the, spe the herbicides that I do is they tend to be harder to get them to do that. Some of these other herbicides like um, picloram, which is Tordon, and some of these others, they're much more sensitive to that kind of issue and much more, have much more ability to move around in the soil. Typically, what I found, it's pretty hard to get to those maximum label rates by doing cut stump treatments for, for glyphosate and triclopyr. But it is something to cons be concerned about. Uh, questions about black locust. So black locust is a difficult one to control. We've had challenges because it suckers so bad. If you cut one down, you'll have a bunch of them. Um, we've had our best luck with bigger black locust doing double girdles and then treating the herbicide in that lower girdle. It seems when you do a double girdle, it doesn't stimulate it to sucker as much as if you cut the whole thing down. But it's a challenging one. So it's one that it's a difficult one to control. Well, it, it's good, you know, and that's a good comment too. There are some people, now there's a lot of mixed uh, comments about that. There's some people saying that it is a health risk, other people saying there's no real strong uh, data on it being a health risk. But in general, you want to limit your exposure. So, and that's why I said if you, if you do spray over your head and stuff like that, you don't want to do that because that's adding more exposure. You want to spray where you haven't been. For the aerial applications, um, there's very, there's boundaries. There's stuff that you don't want to spray when there's a lot of wind. You don't want to spray when there's a temperature inversion. You definitely don't want to be in there, right? So you, you, there's some steps and some practices you do to limit your exposure to it. Now, so the question, if you didn't hear, was about is it too late right now to do it? We're getting to that time of year, um, and I'm from a little farther south, if you couldn't tell by my accent, um, that it, the plants are already, if they're not leafing out, they're already starting to bud swell. So at this point right now, I would not do those kind of treatments. I think they're ineffective from this point until they're fully leafed out later in late spring. That's the period you want to avoid. So uh, yes, so you can. So if you cut it now and let it sucker, you can spray those with the foliar spray later. What you've got to be careful with that is you're, you're changing the root to leaf ratio. So each leaf can only take up so much herbicide. So if you cut it down and let it sucker, you have a reduced number of leaves that you're spraying. So you have to let it get actually big enough to have enough leaves to take enough herbicide to kill those roots. So if you do that, I always typically recommend that you want those uh, suckers to be three to four feet tall or two to three feet tall as to get enough leaf area to be able to kill those plants. If you hit them too early and there's a small amount of leaves, you won't get enough herbicide in there to control them. Um, you could, so that would, I mean, that's doubling your work. So you could cut them now and then come back later and recut them. Uh, to me, I would just wait and cut them later. You know, I, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's, I don't think you gain any benefit from cutting them now and not cutting them later outside of maybe reducing some seed set. But again, these, there's very little, there's very little seed bank potential with this plant anyway. So to me, I wouldn't do that. I think it would be extraneous. It'd be a little bit, I would save my effort. I would go pull garlic mustard or something now and then wait till the fall and, or the, even late summer and do that. No, that's a good question. No, I, I guess there's no effective really late winter, early spring treatment. So in that coming out of winter, March, there's not. But winter time in general, that dormant season is our ideal time for doing cut stump treatments and basil bark. 
If the, if the temperature is below freezing, you'd want to use those oil-based herbicides for the cut stump. Um, and it's very effective. So no, we do, we switch and we do almost all of this cut stump stuff dormant season. It's very effective. Glyphosate? You, you can, and, but, the, but you're mixing it with water and if it's below freezing, you don't want to use that because it's going to freeze and not take up. If it's below freezing in the winter, we use the oil-based herbicides because they don't freeze. But yeah, no, it's very effective. Absolutely. But you're going to stay away from that late winter, early spring. That's the period you don't want to do anything. Um, for cut stump treatments, I don't use Roundup when it's freezing. If it's 35 degrees, I'll use it. Um, now, for foliar spray, I want it above 50 degrees. I don't have any experience burning burning bush, which is a weird statement to say, isn't it? Um, I, I, so I can't speak to that one. I've never done it. Um, Multiflora rose, it seems, the, the times I've burned it, it knocks it back. It seems to be able to sucker or grow right back after that but it definitely does a good job of kind of top killing it and keeping it down. I've seen places that burn a lot and it keeps it in check. So I think it's an effective method to limit its impact, but it's not gonna eradicate it in my experience. Sure, yeah, 2,4-D works really well for, for multiflora rows. You have to get every bit of that product. Yep, absolutely, you have to do a thorough treatment. But yeah, 2,4-D works good for multiflora rows, absolutely. Um, that's a good question. So the question was about mixing your herbicide with miracle Grow. Often, not for cut stump as much because you're not relying on that plant growing, but we often do mix ammonium sulfate or, or something else with foliar applications to kind of stimulate that plant to grow a little bit when we're trying to kill it. So that's, that's very effective and that's kind of a standard practice when we're mixing uh, glyphosate particularly up for foliar applications. I don't think it's really necessary for cut stump applications because it's a different mechanism that you're using for that plant to control. You're not stimulating, you don't want it to grow right there. So the question's about prescribed fire and pastured goats. Um, on a small scale, if you can control that application, it does a, seems to do a good job of knocking it back. What I've not seen, and I've looked at quite a bit of this, I've not seen the ability to completely eradicate honeysuckle or some of these invasive, invasive species using goats alone without other non-target impacts. So that people always say, and, I, and I'm a goat keeper myself, so I've got first-hand experience with it. They say the, the number one preferred species for, for goats are bush honeysuckle. The second one is oak. So um, the, so what I've found is if, if you get it in there, they'll knock it back and reduce its, its abundance, and then you would want to come back for some other follow-up treatment. If you leave them on long enough or you hit them too hard, um, what you're going to end up doing is impacting other species that you may want to keep, in my experience. But it's very effective in those instances where you kind of come in to really reduce them. That's been what I've seen. So I think there's a place for it. It's, if, you, if you have a, that's a good question, with well, a succession of it. If you have a bad infestation of, of a lot of these plants, they cast so much shade, their leaves typically break down quickly in the soil, you have a hard time burning through a heavy infested honeysuckle stand. So in that case, you would probably want to consider something to reduce the honeysuckle down first to get something else growing in there, to get better leaves on the ground, so you can actually carry a fire through it, in my sense. So if you wanted to use both of those, you may want to put the goats in first to knock it back, and then do the prescribed fire. But again, it's every, every situation is different, so it's hard to say specifically. No. So, um, and if you didn't hear, the question is that her husband is a little is overzealous and uses a lot of herbicide. The, and you know, you'll kill it, but the problem with that is, and we, just from the question a minute ago, you're adding a lot more herbicide on there, one that's taking money, but you're also creeping up a lot closer to that maximum label rate, and there's potential for other impacts. I use just enough to control it, and, I, and I'm a little liberal. Again, I like it where it starts to run down the edge a little bit. I don't just dab, but I don't go to that level where I'm doing that. The, the question's about basil bark and autumn olive and whether you need to go all the way around the plant um, or not. In my experience, you do. So I've done that where I'm lazy and I only treat three quarters of that plant, especially with triclip ears, which you use for, for, for um, basil bark. You get streaking a lot where you'll kill three quarters of the plant and this side will still be alive. So I, in my experience, I have to go all the way around or I have to treat every stem for it to work. If I get lazy and not do that, that's when I start missing plants. Why are you asking me about killing walnut trees? <laughs> I would imagine any woody plant that, yeah, you can do that and it would work. 
No, not this time of year. It's growing as well. Any woody plants starting to expand right now at this time of year, it's not effective to kill woody plants. Well, yeah, you guys are farther north. You look at the buds. If the buds are swelling or not, if the buds are swelling and the sap's starting to run, that it's not going to be effective to control that. Me personally, I would.